This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to the American Monetary Association's podcast, where we explore how monetary policy impacts the real lives of real people and the action steps necessary to preserve wealth and enhance one's lifestyle. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. David D. Friedman to the show. He is the son of Milton and Rose Friedman. You've certainly heard of Milton Friedman before, and I hope you have read his books. He's a professor of law at Santa Clara University and contributing editor to Liberty Magazine. He's the best-selling author of The Machinery of Freedom, A Guide to Radical Capitalism, and uh, several other books, including his latest, which is entitled Legal Systems Very Different from Ours. David, welcome. How are you? I'm fine. Uh, I am currently, however, an emeritus professor. I retired a year and a half ago. Well, congratulations. Congratulations. So, hey, I'm looking forward to uh, diving into really both of these topics. This will be kind of a split show, but the legal system is so important to maintain a free market and have capitalism exist, obviously. Uh, so let's talk about the machinery of freedom first. Now, this was uh, an older book, but you revised it recently, right? Yes, the machinery was published in the early 1970s, so it's now something like 45 years old. And a few years ago, I brought out a third edition with about 100 pages of additional material, which was a lot of fun. What is the basic premise? Does it follow your father's line of thinking, or uh, you know, does it diverge in a different way? Tell us a little bit about it. That depends on what part of it. Mm-hmm. Parts of it are arguing for libertarian views in general. Mm-hmm. But the part which is, I suppose, most original is sketching out what a society might look like in which all government functions have been replaced by private institutions. Mm-hmm. So in that sense, it's more extreme than the positions that my father was arguing for. He was basically asking how within the framework of our present society can we make things better by making them freer. Mm -hmm. And I'm asking the question, what would a society look like in which you carried that program all of the way to entirely abolishing government? And how you plausibly imagine institutions working, mm-hmm. which provided private substitutes for police courts and the like. Right. And what would the result be? I try to use economics to answer the question, what would the market for law produce? Mm-hmm. If you think of law not as produced by a political mechanism, but as produced by a market mechanism. Mm-hmm. Part of the connection between that and my most recent book is that I concluded when studying a whole bunch of past societies that in a certain sense I had been reinventing the wheel. That is that there had been much more primitive societies which had a sort of a much simpler version of what I was describing in which law enforcement was in fact private and decentralized. Mm -hmm. So I have a chapter in the new book discussing that kind of society, what it needs to work, and historical examples of those. Okay, so when I talk to uh, libertarians, including when I look in the mirror and talk to myself, I always think it's a great idea to privatize this, that, and the other thing, until it comes down to about maybe three things I sort of can't see private enterprise doing. I don't think government does much well, but I do think they do a few things well. I don't know. Can you privatize everything? For example, let's just be specific on a couple things if we can. You talk about the legal system, and we'll dive into that a little bit more. But what about just building permits and food safety and, uh, you know, some of these sort of basic things people consider to be infrastructure? I don't think any of those things require government activity. When you buy a house, you care whether it's going to fall down, Mm -hmm. and there's no reason you can't have, and in fact, you do have private institutions which set up rules for how you're supposed to build a building, and if you conform to those, you can claim to have conformed to those. Similarly, with regard to food, a grocery store chain that sells food that makes people drop dead is likely to go out of business, and they have a strong incentive to try to make sure that the food is safe. So I think those are the easy problems. I would say that the three fundamental functions are police courts and national defense. Okay, before you get into that, though, let me just ask you a question about that. See, I think that part of the problem, and, and listen, philosophically, I agree with you. I'm just wondering how it works in practice is all. Part of the problem is there's this big lag time in a lot of circumstances in life, right? Let's say it's a drug, and I know your father had a lot, wrote a lot about the FDA, and I agree with his thinking, by the way. 
but it takes a long time before you see the consequence of something. So if someone, you know, in, in the private world, if they want to cut corners to save expenses or be more expedient, you know, it might take a long time to figure out that they've damaged somebody, right? It might indeed, yeah. but it might equally take a long time for a government regulator to figure out that something is safe. And while they were figuring that out, people die because they're not allowed to use the new drug. We happen to have yeah, evidence. Yeah, I see on that this for sure because, with the FDA. Because yes. the FDA, as you may know, many years ago, the FDA put out a press release in which they admitted to killing 100,000 people. That isn't how they put it. Fair enough. What yeah. They, what they did was this had to do with the issue of beta blockers. Mm -hmm. Beta blockers are drugs used to prevent a second heart attack. Right. They had been widely used outside of the U.S. for a decade or more before the FDA decided to approve them. Right. And when it approved them, it estimated that approving them would save eight to ten thousand lives a year. So if they were, say, 10 to 12 years, they kept them off the market. I don't remember the exact timing, eight to 10,000 lives a year. That means that their particular caution had killed about 100,000 people by their estimate. There isn't a way of playing safe. It isn't an option. It seems to me that the way you solve this problem in the private enterprise world is you do it with insurance policies. And, you know, if a builder wants to build a home or someone wants to make a drug or someone wants to sell you food or whatever they want to do, if they want to be your local police department that's a capitalist operated police department, whatever it is, right, they have to buy an insurance policy. And there's a private insurance company taking the risk that's going to examine them to make sure they're playing right. Is that's certainly one way, but there are lots of different ways things okay. are happening in the market. I don't think you can easily predict which one will turn out to be optimal. Okay. That's one way. Another way is that you have a large firm with a big reputation at stake, and it says, take the historical example of Sears. Sears did not make stuff. Sears sold stuff other people made, mostly under their own brand name. Sure. And what were they doing? Part of what they were doing was saying to their customers, this company that made this particular shovel you never heard heard of, they could be making a junky shovel and you would waste your money and only discover when it broke down. But you know that if the shovel you buy from Sears turns out to be junk, you'll be less likely to buy stuff from Sears. So it's in our interest to right. do the work. So that's one way of doing it. Okay. Insuring is another way of doing it. Uh, there are a variety of different possible mechanisms. So, so the one way you mentioned with Sears is just have a clearinghouse, have a retailer, essentially. Who has right? a reputation. Yeah, has right. A reputation so they have the reputation and they are in charge of vetting the home builder. Okay, so you'd have another party in there, another layer, someone, else, another middleman. That's, that's right? one way of doing okay. it. Another way, if, if you look at, at how eBay works, mm -hmm. eBay provides Reviews, reputational, yeah, reputational mechanisms. Yeah. It isn't eBay's reputation. eBay right. is not saying this product is any good. Right. eBay is merely saying, we will report to you yeah. the information we have from other people. Essentially the same as Amazon. And re Amazon thanks, thankfully, is. reviews are getting much more popular. But of course, they have their problems too, but maybe they're yeah. less problem than government. Okay. I don't think you should assume there are perfect solutions to these things. I think one of the mistakes that defenders of the free market often make is to imply that with the free market, nothing wrong will ever happen. Yeah. And that isn't true, yeah. uh, that both people make mistakes. And there are ways economists have analyzed in some detail, which we refer to under the general term of market failure, in which even if nobody makes a mistake, you get the wrong answer. Mm -hmm. Those are things like public good problems and externalities. Yep. Those all of the implication of those things is that a perfect free market system, there will sometimes people will sometimes do things they shouldn't do or fail to do things they should. And the response to that is we have no better mechanism that if you think about the reasons why the market sometimes doesn't work, those are also reasons why the political market sometimes doesn't work. And the difference is that those reasons are the exception on the private market and the rule on the public market. If you think about the basic logic of market failure, which isn't just about free markets, is that it's a situation where individual rationality doesn't produce group rationality. And the reason is that the decision that I make has its costs or benefits largely to other people. So if you think about why in a free market I might pollute even though I shouldn't, even though the damage to the people downwind is larger than the benefit to me. The reason is that I'm getting the benefit of making steel and putting stuff out the chimney and other people are getting the cost. If you think about the reason why some basic research might not be done that's worth doing, it's because that research produces benefits for lots of other people and I can't collect on it. All of that could happen in the free market. 
But you then think about the political system and on the political system, it's normally the case that when somebody takes an action, he bears neither the cost nor gets the benefit. Okay, so the tell, tell us more about that then. Deep dive sure. into that. Take the question of why democracy works as badly as it does. There's this famous quote from Churchill, yeah. democracy <laughs> is the worst form of government except for all the others. I, I love that quote. Yeah. <laughs> but people normally treat that as though it's an argument for democracy. Mm-hmm. It's actually an argument against government. It's mm-hmm. saying the best way we have of running government works very badly. And there's a reason. The sort of what I think of as the civics class model of democracy is that the government has to do the right thing or we'll vote them out. For that to work, the voters have to be well informed both about what the right thing is and about what the individual politicians have done in the political process to get or not get it. That information is costly information that requires a lot of time and effort to figure out. There is no benefit to the individual voter from getting that information. If you are in a country the size of the U.S., the chance that your vote will flip the result of a presidential election is something well under one in a million, maybe one in 10 million or so. You are not going to make an investment of hundreds of hours of effort for a one in a million chance of making the world better. If you are an individual judge in our system and you set a precedent that that happens to be a mistake, a precedent that results in the system working less well, you'll never find out. You could have imposed cost. If you imagine a precedent that makes GNP lower by a hundredth of a percent, if you work that out, that's an enormous amount of damage for one human being to make but he'll never know it. Ditto for the legislator, ditto for the lobbyist. All of those people in the political system are taking actions, most of whose costs are borne, and often most of whose benefits are received by other people. Therefore, they have no incentive. The way a decentralized system has to work is you have a system where if something is worth taking, it's worth my doing it. If it's not worth, worth doing for all of us, it's not worth my doing it. The free market gets that result most of the time, Mm -hmm. because if I produce something, I've got to pay for the inputs. So I'm bearing the cost of of the things I'm using. I get paid for the output. So I'm getting most of the benefit. So if benefit is larger than cost for me, it's probably larger than cost for us. Political system, that's not true. So you have ways in which the market doesn't work, but they are ways that are much less common on the market than on the only alternative we have, which is the, the political system. So that, I think, is the basic argument for, for the free market. Mm-hmm. And I have a chapter in the new edition of Machinery uh, where I think the title is Market Failure Considered as an Argument Both for and Against Government. It's an argument for government because it shows that the market is not perfect. It is an ar- stronger argument against government because it shows that the political market is more imperfect than the private market. So. That's one of the things I discuss in the book. You know what uh, happens a lot, at least to me, in these debates I have with my leftist friends, and you must have quite a few of them in your environment at Santa Clara, (laughs) is is that it comes down to this thing of, you know, really the Sherlock Holmes, you can't hear the dogs that don't bark, right? You know, like the thing you mentioned about the beta blockers and the FDA, right? You know, no one's paying attention to the 100,000 people that died, right? Mm. They're only paying attention to the few things that work or don't work, you know, Mm. where, oh, hey, a beta blocker killed someone, right? They don't pay attention to what the profound impact of the things that are really unseen. That's the problem with these. It makes me wonder if there will ever be any change. Even if your proposal is dramatically better and your father's proposals are dramatically better. I mean, I really liked his argument about the FDA, uh, the way he talked about that, how, you know, especially rare diseases where they're, you know, drugs have a, a small upside, but a big downside, right, to the bureaucrat. Uh, I remember that argument very well. It's very yeah. sensible. But I don't know, will there ever be any change? Some things do change. Yeah. We don't have a draft anymore. Yeah. We don't have a military draft. Okay. We're still signing people up for the military draft that we don't have. And we may stop doing that if the courts decide, as they seem to be deciding, that we have to sign up women, too. Mm-hmm. That may make it sufficiently politically unpopular. Right. We have floating exchange rates, which we didn't have when my father started writing. We have, I think, more sentiment in favor of free trade, although that's been beginning to reverse a little bit recently. But as a result, partly of the fact that economists for about the last 200 years have been arguing that tariffs usually make the country that impose them worse off, not better off. So things do sometimes change. What's interesting in a way is there's a bit, I don't know if you've read Lord of the Rings, but Mm -hmm. there's a little bit near the end where 
Gandalf, I think, is saying, we've solved this problem. That doesn't mean that problems are over. You can't look forward to sort of heaven. That means that there will be other things that will arise in the future, just as we thought two ages ago that the good guys had solved the problem when they destroyed Morgoth. Mm-hmm. But then Sauron came up. And similarly, one of the things that strikes me looking at political arguments in my lifetime is that we largely defeated socialism. I'm talking about intellectually, and that's partly due to the collapse of the Soviet Union. And yes, people talk about socialism now, but mostly what they're really talking about is a welfare state. Sweden and Denmark and Norway are not socialist countries. They're capitalist countries with a good deal of income redistribution. And that almost nobody is willing to seriously argue for a centrally planned economy, which was, after all, the basic socialist idea. On the other hand, environmentalism has replaced it. Mm -hmm. So that the arguments now against laissez-faire are often environmentalist arguments. Like the old saying goes, green trees have red roots. Doesn't even have to be the roots. Part of it's true in the sense that one reason some people like environmentalism is because it gives them arguments for things they want to do anyway. Mm -hmm. There's a wonderful cartoon, which I like because what it betrays of the peop- about the people who drew it and who admire it. And the cartoon is somebody saying, what if global warming is really false and we do all of these good things and it doesn't stop global warming? The obvious implication being they're obviously all good things. I don't remember the whole list, but it's right. basically a checklist of people left of center want to do. Mm-hmm. But of course, the mirror image of that is that implies those people would be in favor of doing those things even if they didn't believe in global warming which is a reason to be a little more skeptical about their environmentalist arguments. But Mm -hmm. what I was going to say is that environmentalism in one sense is an improvement on socialism because it's actually a better argument. But on the other hand, in practice, since the conclusions it leads to are mostly conclusions about giving government power to make decisions, and there's no particular reason to expect government to make better decisions for the environment than anybody else, it has bad consequences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's shift gears a little bit and sure. talk about the legal system. Your your sure. latest book, I've always found this fascinating, especially uh, since reading Ayn Rand years ago and her writing about how, you know, that's really the one of the real roles of government. Now, you may disagree with that. It sounds like you I might. Do. But she at least said, hey, look, at, the government's just got to keep violence from happening. Like, that's their job. And other than that, don't do anything else. Tell us what you learned about looking at these ancient legal systems and so forth. They aren't all ancient. Uh, The legal systems I cover include modern Amish. They include modern Romani. They include Islamic and Jewish law, which still exists, although Jewish law doesn't have very much bite to it anymore. Islamic law. I don't think there are really any societies that really follow Islamic law, even though they talk about it. But those are both interesting systems. So I guess you learn lots of different things. The thing that's most relevant to the issue of whether government has to do it is a set of systems that I refer to as feud law, of which the first one I encountered a long time ago that got me interested in other legal systems was saga period Iceland, Iceland a thousand years ago, which is where we get the word saga because they were the people who wrote the original sagas. And that was a legal system where if you killed somebody, his relatives sued you. Mm -hmm. And if they won the case and you didn't pay the damages and you didn't settle out of court, they killed you. And it was legal for them to kill you. Mm-hmm. And it was illegal for people to defend you once you had lost the case and gotten outlawed. So that was a case where you had a sort of a centralized mechanism for stamping with approval who is or isn't guilty, but there was no centralized enforcement. Right. And there are other systems that go farther in that direction. The Romani, to some extent, the modern Romani even run under a feud system. And the basic logic of a feud system is that if you wrong me, I threaten to harm you unless you compensate me. Mm-hmm. And in order for that to work, there are about four different problems it has to solve. The first problem is making sure that I don't use it as an excuse for extortion. You have to have some way in which my threat to harm you is believable if you really did wrong me and not believable if you didn't. So in the Icelandic case, that's what the court mechanism is doing. Because if I win my court case, then all the neighbors know that when I come after you, I'm the good guy and you're the bad guy. Mm-hmm. And if I don't win the court case and try to threaten you, then the neighbors will support you instead. That would be sort of a simple version. But there are a variety of other ways in which that problem gets solved. But you need some way in which, as I like to put it, in which right makes might. 
some mm -hmm. reason why the threats are believable when you've really been wronged and, and not when they aren't. Second problem you need is a commitment strategy. You need some reason why when I threaten to harm you if you don't compensate me and you reply, well, I'll fight back, I actually carry out my threat instead of backing down. And there are a variety of different ways in which societies uh, have done that. And I would like to claim it even goes back before the human species because you get territorial behavior among some animals where the animal is essentially committed to fight to the death against a trespasser of his own species. And that explains some animal behavior. Third problem we need is how do you protect the weak? You need some way in which people who don't have access to much physical force can still get their rights protected. And my favorite example of that is, again, the Icelandic system, because in the Icelandic system, tort claims were marketable. They were transferable. So I'm an elderly oh, man. Oh, wow. So you can transfer it to a big, strong guy. <laughs> yeah. I'm an elderly man mm -hmm. who has one son and the son is killed by someone. Uh -huh. And I know that if I try to go to court to sue him, I'll get beaten up on the way to the court. Uh -huh. But my neighbor, he's got four big sons who went a Viking in their youth and lots of relatives and allies. So I transfer the case to him. He prosecutes and collects the very sizable damages for killing. If it's an easy case, maybe he agrees to give me part of the money. If it's a hard case, maybe he doesn't. But either way, the person who did the killing gets punished, either pays damages or gets killed. So therefore, even though I have no force, I can do it. And I've argued that this is one respect in which the American legal system is a mere thousand years behind the cutting edge of legal technology. Because if you think about it, making tort claims transferable would have substantial benefits in our legal system. If you think about the person, somebody smashes your car and you aren't a lawyer, maybe you can afford a lawyer, maybe you can't. But even if you can afford a lawyer, how do you figure out for this one time in your life when you need a lawyer, who's the lawyer who will do a good job? Mm -hmm. If you have marketable tort claims, you don't have to do any of that. You just ask who's willing to bid the most to buy my claim. And then the law firm that can do the best job of collecting damages for your car is the one that is going to make the highest offer. You are now still in it as a witness, but you no longer are a party. You've, you've been paid. And I've discussed a number of other ways in which that, that would be useful. So part of the fun of this is seeing that some of the ideas – I have a different case where I discovered that a really neat and weird institution in Periclean Athens – was paralleled by the way they run horse races today in America. What's called a claiming race okay. uses the same basic logic as the way in which people in Pericle and Athens arranged to get public goods produced. If you read the book, you can, you can see the description of that, but that's part of the fun of it. So anyway, so the, oh, the fourth problem you have to solve in a feud system is how you prevent what people imagine in a feud system, namely, I think you've wronged me, I claim it. You refuse to pay because you think you haven't. I harm you. You then say, well, then now I've got to get revenge and it goes back and forth. Right. And that actually is pretty uncommon in real feud systems. And there are various mechanisms by which you prevent that. The mm -hmm. one standard mechanism you see in the Icelandic sagas is you find some powerful, high reputation person and both sides, you will arbitrate the dispute. Mm -hmm. And now if he rules against me, I don't look like a wimp for giving in. And if he rules against me and I don't give in, he's just been added to the other side. So I'm going to lose. People listening probably have visions of all kinds of violence in the streets uh, with this type of thing. Yeah, well, I think such evidence as we got for Iceland, the way I like to put it, the Icelandic system lasted for about a third of a millennium, about mm. 330 years. So quite a long, lot longer than ours has. The last 50 years were pretty bad. You were getting essentially what was turning into a civil, sort of a civil war over who would run things. But as best I can tell, the number of people killed in that per capita was somewhere around the U.S. highway death rate. And the number of people killed in 50 years of what they regarded as unacceptable violence was almost certainly smaller than the number of people killed in three weeks of the year 1066 in wars between governments. The the battles of Stamford Bridge and, and Hastings. But the wars are, that's a different concept. Uh, this it is really about... isn't because the breakdown was really becoming a civil war. Uh -huh. And of course, the U.S. Civil War killed quite a lot of people, too. So again, there's, there are no perfect systems out there. Right. right? You know, I, I agree with you. There are no perfect systems. But, you know, as we wrap it up here, you just keep making me think of uh, privatized prisons, Right. Which is an idea when I first heard about that, maybe in the mid 90s, 
I was very much in favor of it. I thought, of course, the private sector will do a much better job than the government. But then you see these corrupt judges putting kids in jail. And there's like in this incentivize, you know, it's when you incentivize war with the central banking system, you've incentivized war because it's profitable. When you make taking people's freedom away profitable, you know, that doesn't Correct. lead to anything I, good. I, I, in fact, have a journal article. Yeah. Okay which is on the question of why you don't always want the most efficient punishment. Mm -hmm. That if you think about different punishments, that fines are the most efficient punishment because what the criminal loses, someone else gets. Mm -hmm. Execution is more efficient a punishment than imprisonment. The criminal loses one life, which nobody gets, so it's worse than a fine. But with imprisonment, the criminal loses his freedom and you have to run the prison. So it looks like you should always have the most efficient system. You say, wait a minute, the problem with that is that that means that somebody else is benefiting by the conviction, and that gives people an incentive to convict people whether or not they're innocent. Yeah, and we've seen that. Yes, the I had an argument along sorts of lines you're describing that was more elaborate than yours a long time ago, and somebody online uh, said, yeah, the, the colonial powers in Africa did that. When they needed a road built, they would find an excuse to arrest a bunch of people, and then their sentence would be to work on the road. And yeah. I then realized that H.L. Mencken, a writer I'm fond of, mm -hmm. actually has an anecdote about the same thing happening in a less unpleasant form in America, yeah. where you've got a jail warden who likes to have his jail fixed up. Yeah. So every year... Or, or he, license plates made or whatever, whatever cheap he, labor. Every, yeah. every year, he makes a list of... He needs one plumber, two painters, mm -hmm. a list of the workers he needs. Mm -hmm. He gives them to the relevant police officer. The police officer goes around the bars yeah. and finds an excuse to sure. arrest yeah. that set of people. They spend a few days in jail, fixing up the jail, and then they get turned loose. So that's a problem you have to worry about. And, and, and that's certainly true. And it's much more sophisticated than that, sadly. You have these private prison companies that have an army of lobbyists that are lobbying for more draconian laws so they can fill their prisons. But it isn't just the private prisons. The lobbyists for keeping up the number of prisoners, at least in California, are primarily the prison guard union. So you don't oh, solve that problem yeah. by having government do it either. No, I agree. It's an interesting yeah. set of problems, and it yeah. would take longer than we have to yeah. discuss. But what I try to sketch in Machinery of Freedom is a system in which the laws are coming out of a market which is considering the costs and benefits on everybody affected because – well, I can't really explain it in this amount of time. Mm -hmm. If you want to read sure. – people are interested in Machinery of Freedom. The second edition is a free download from my webpage, mm -hmm. which is daviddfriedman.com. Mm -hmm. The third edition is a fairly inexpensive Kindle on Amazon and legal systems very different is also both a print version and a Kindle on Amazon and the Kindle is very cheap. Yeah. I, I try to make my stuff cheap because I'm mostly trying to spread ideas. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. David, thank you so much. Really fascinating. Do you have a website you want to give out or a Twitter handle or anything? My website is daviddfriedman.com. And it's got links to a lot of my published work that you can read for free. It has a link to my blog, which is not very active at the moment because I've gotten active on someone else's very interesting blog. Mm -hmm. But my blog has a lot of stuff from the past, and I occasionally still make posts on it. The blog is called Ideas, and it covers whatever I feel like talking about. And that includes global warming. It includes status. Uh, it includes a whole lot of different things. Fantastic. Well, David, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, hartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own, and if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.